This will be the third part of the spiritual benefits series as we look at still a larger portion of Ephesians 1, verse 7. This is the infallible, inerrant, and inspired Word of God. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness, the forgiveness of trans, trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth. In him also we have redempt, obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. To the end, that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Pray with me. Father, this evening, as we look into the work of your Son, I pray now that you would open our hearts and minds to understand these things, that your Holy Spirit would make things clear, that we would understand the riches of our inheritance found only in your Son that you would also reveal your mysteries. Lord, what was not revealed in times past, but is now clear, I pray that you would reveal it to your church, to the praise of your glory. In your Son's name, amen. As we continue, in a sense, still taking inventory of spiritual benefits, the spiritual benefits of knowing God, in his gospel, but more importantly, being known by God. Paul in Galatians 4.9 puts it this way, now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God. 1 Corinthians 8.3, Paul further says, if anyone loves God, he is known by him. We've already seen much of the the vaults in the sense of heaven opened up to us from last week. These vaults that he opens up only to his children. These riches that were determined in eternity past. What have we seen thus far? Well, let's take a look as a review. Look at verse 4. Just as he chose us in him. This, this first treasure that we find is the electing work of salvation in his choosing. No foreseen action or condition met by the sinner to move God's hand, but just God's sovereign plan. We see this because he did this, the verse says, before the foundations of the world. This is unconditional sovereign election. I, I like this because you ever had those um, contests and you have to, they say, well, no purchase necessary. This is kind of like that. With God, there is nothing that you did. You didn't have to buy anything. You didn't have to live a certain kind of life. None of that. What's the second benefit? Look at verse 5. He predestined us to adoption. He, the Lord makes this determination beforehand. And what, the, what is this determination that he makes? That he would adopt those that would believe. He didn't consult anyone. He didn't consult you. And if he did, we would be lost still. Yet, in his kind intention, verse 5 says, or in some translations it says, or in his good pleasure, within his will, he adopted us. 
He redeemed us and placed us under His fatherly care. Let's work these thoughts out. I think before we get into this passage, it would prepare us to ponder these things, maybe a little bit different, to look at it as, as, as if we were climbing this most wonderful mountain. But to try to get to the pinnacle of grace, which is impossible, but to see it this way, working backwards, like it says, he adopted us as sons and daughters through Christ. He predestined us through Christ. Verse 4 says that you are blameless because he placed you in Christ. Verse 4 again says you are holy or separated unto him because he placed you in Christ. You are chosen or elect because he did that in Christ. For what major overarching purpose? Verse 6 says, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Remember last week's points? They were simple. They were His choice, His will, and His freedom. I don't know anyone else that would say, I don't want God in control of salvation. I want to place it into the hands of men and women. No, it's His choice, His will, and His freedom, and we ought to love that. Our next three points for this particular sermon, and these are specific now to the workings of Christ, because the first part of this doxology was the workings of the Father in eternity past, and now we see the workings of Christ in time. So our three points is redemption, revelation, and rule. Redemption, revelation, and rule. Before we get into the text, I would I want to address a few objections. I think last week I didn't have enough time and, and I might not even have enough time to even share these right now, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, there's objections that are found for in certain circles of theologians about election and predestination. The things that I shared last week would be controversial. They would say these things. There's three objections or major objections to election and predestination. Number one, it undermines evangelism. This is where the argument would be. It undermines evangelism. They would say something like this. God will save his elect, so we don't have to evangelize. This is a complete and utter ignorance or misunderstanding. I tend more to ignorance, misunderstanding of the sovereignty of God. God ordains, listen, the plan... Listen to this. God ordains the plan, and surprise, surprise, He ordains the means. We do not serve a God that is not wise, right? So we have to think to ourselves, if he, if he has a plan, He will see it forth. And by doing so, He will do it in means, using whatever is at His disposal. And what is that? Well, let me give you an example if you've never seen this before. In Daniel 9, you don't have to turn there. In Daniel 9, Daniel begins to give a prophecy. He will begin to tell us of, of, that there is a coming restoration of, of Israel. And he sets forth this numbers and he starts multiplying it, and it calculates out to 490 years until the captivity and the return and the restoration of not just, not just Jerusalem, but the walls surrounding it. And you see this down to the T. 
You see it in Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah knew Daniel's prophecy, and God used Nehemiah. That was the means. Listen, it, it doesn't go that far. You want New Testament examples? Romans 10, 14. How will they believe? How will someone believe? How will they hear without a preacher? Will your neighbor get saved if you don't share the gospel with them? The answer is no. Will they get saved if you do? I don't know. But God knows. But he uses means. He tells us this. Look in, in, even in the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Look at, turn to Matthew 28. We see this in the Great Commission where he says, you guys all know this verse. This is verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. But you see, when people read this, like the mission organizations, they love that verse, obviously. But that is not the motivation. The sovereignty of Christ is the motivation. Go one verse above. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, Here we go. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. What is our motivation in evangelism? That Christ is sovereign in heaven and on earth. He says this. Look at We want to see it played out. Turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts 18, you see Paul here. There's a lot of angst and doesn't know what to do. He's, he's in Corinth, but he wants to move on. And he has these, this, he has fear. In verse 9, this is what the Lord says to him. And, and the Lord said to Paul in the, in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Paul is scared, right? That's clear. But why does he tell him that he should not be scared about him going, moving forward and preaching the gospel? This is what it says in verse 10. For I am with you, that's number one, and no man will attack you in order to harm you. So he gives him some security. But this is not the best thing. The best thing is right here at the end. For I have many people in this city. That's the sovereignty of God. Why is Paul going to go into that town? Because God is with him. A, a, a big plus is that he's not going to get hurt. But the greatest one is, I guarantee success in your evangelism. Because I have my people that I have gathered. I'm going to gather to myself. Look at chapter 13 of Acts. Verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Why? And as many as had been appointed, here we go, predestined, elected, as many had been appointed to eternal life believed. No less and no more. No, it doesn't undermine evangelism. It fuels evangelism. Why do we evangelize? Well, we've seen it in Matthew 28 because the Lord Jesus commanded it. Secondly, again, what I'm telling you this whole time is because the Lord guarantees success. And lastly, because you, you, could be a part of his sovereign plan. His means of drawing someone to himself. What an opportunity. Job 37, I love this. Job 37, 13 says this. Whether for correction or for his world 
or for loving kindness, listen to what he says, he causes it to happen. Job is, telling, Job is saying, if it's, if it's for God's correction, if it's for the world at large, if it's for his loving kindness, even in salvation, he says, he will make it happen. Secondly, they say that it undermines humility. They'll say something, well, I guess we're superior to other people because we're elect. That that goes contrary to the gospel. This, to be honest, is, is again a wrong understanding of sovereignty. You think he chose you because of anything that's in you? And if you do think that, then then yes, you may you may have a a central focus or a man centered gospel, but it's not the salvation that's found in Christ alone for his glory. It's not it. If you think, listen, if you think you deserve salvation, you may not be saved. Turn to John chapter 1. This is what he says about those that have come to know Christ. John 1. Think of verse 12 first. He says, But as many as received him, to him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Who gives the right? Even to those who believe in his name. And look at it, it goes further. Verse 13. Who were born not of blood, not of not of fleshly generation, not of your, your mother or your father, or the will of the flesh, like as if you actually saved yourself by some sort of willpower. No. Not the will of the flesh nor the will of man. None of your free will. What does it say? but of God. You didn't save yourself and you don't keep yourself. Romans Romans 3.20 talks about this. If you remember this verse, it's pretty well known. It says, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. No, it, it... it isn't you. It doesn't undermine. True saving faith does not undermine humility. It actually magnifies it. Lastly, it undermines, they say it would undermine holiness or sanctification. Something like this. I have, not, I have no need to strive towards holiness because, you know, once saved, always saved. You know, be careful your antinomianism is showing. If you really think that. You really think that the law doesn't apply to you? Do you think that just God has cast off His perfect law for His people? No. You see, the law had its first purpose before you came to Christ. It had a purpose to be a schoolmaster, a tutor, to draw you to Christ. You know, back in the days, I was way out of school by then, so I'm not that old, but some of you in here remember this when they used to give you guys the paddle, right? Just imagine the law being that. You should stop doing that because I don't think you want this paddle again. But see, now, in Christ, when, when the law becomes a delight to you, it becomes like as if you go to the, the fridge and it becomes the family rules. Like, these are the rules of the home. If you declare yourself to be in this family, these are the standards that you follow. And you look at them now and you say, yes, I love my Heavenly Father. I want to follow these rules. Listen, this is, this is a, a, to undermine sanctification and holiness, it's, it's an impossibility for the believer. Do you understand that? Second Corinthians 
5.17 says you're a new creation. Romans 6 tells us that you were buried in Christ. Right? 1 John. Turn to 1 John, actually. Let's look at that. 1 John chapter 3. Verse, just verse 9 and 10. Look what it says about the believer. Verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. That's, that's, a, that's a clear statement. You know, let me give you a shortcut. You know what it means? It means this. If you have really come to believe in Christ, if you have come to encounter the saving, risen Savior, you come to trust in Him, it is impossible that you are the same person. It is impossible that you could be the same person if you sit before me and you said you trusted in Christ and you're the same person, I would point you to 1 John and tell you, you might not be saved. Because the Savior I know transforms lives. So no, it doesn't undermine holiness or sanctification. True saving faith, it magnifies it. Election magnifies it. Predestination magnifies it. The sovereignty of God magnifies it. Now that we kind of set that aside, let's get into our text. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to this first point, redemption. Redemption. This being most literally the greatest of our spiritual benefits. The, the greatest of our spiritual benefits in real time. Look at what it says in verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. So this is where I'm talking about when it mentions his blood. We enter into the, the doxology here that begins to, be, to talk about Christ. It tells us the work of Christ Jesus in time. No longer in eternity past, but now it tells us 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus lived a sinless life. And after a ministry of three and a half years, he was crucified for our redemption. And if that wasn't enough, he, he rises from the dead for our justification, and by that victorious work, we receive our next benefit. What's our next benefit? Look at verse 7. We see redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. The forgiveness of our trespasses, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of His grace. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2, look at verse 16. It says this, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ, in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by the faith in Christ and not of the works of the law. And here's the crux of the matter. Since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. He goes on, verse 17, But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. God forbid. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. If I, if I claim Christ, and then I, I choose to try this legalism a form of self-righteousness to save myself. He goes, am I building upon 
something that Christ has already done? You can't. Then you prove yourself maybe that you're still a sinner, unredeemed. For through the law I died, it says in verse 19. I died in, through the law so that I might live to God. That, that's, that's the beauty of redemption. It's not your doing. Look at verse 20. You guys know this. Galatians 2.20. One of my favorite verses, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, in the flesh I live by, the, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes to the law, then Christ died needlessly. If you could save yourself, then the cross was in vain. But it is not. It is not. Mark 10, 45 says this, is for, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A ransom for many. Titus 2, 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Or 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. You know that verse still baffles me? He who knew no sin, God made him sin on our behalf. Turn back to Ephesians. We see this. This forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of His grace in verse 7. And, and I asked myself when I was reading through this, how much, if, if I had to do a, a quantitative analogy, like... How much forgiveness and grace did he give to us? Like we understand, like we say here, like you kind of toss it around. It's like I know that Christ died for my past sins, my present sins, and my future sins. But that doesn't, that doesn't tell us everything of this forgiveness. No. The, Paul, the word that Paul uses does in verse 8 is which he lavished on us. Let, let me give you kind of a picture of this. It, it's the same word that the Lord Jesus used in Matthew 5. So Matthew 5, verse 20, he says this, Unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees, he says, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. So that word lavish... The same word in Matthew 5.20 is surpasses. What's he saying here? Unless the quantity and quality of your righteousness surpasses abundantly, lavishly, abounds more than the outward righteousness of these religious leaders, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. That's bad news. These Pharisees followed the law to a T. But what did Christ do? Did He not do that for you? He says He lavished on us that believe, he says that he abundantly lavished on us without any sort of holding back of anything. He gives more than enough grace in Christ because he infinitely surpasses the righteousness of anyone. He says this, look at, I hate to, Go forward in Ephesians, but look in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. One page over here, it says this. 
and to know the love of Christ, and here's that word again, which surpasses knowledge, then you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. He's saying this, there is no limit to you knowing Christ today and then knowing Him more tomorrow and then being filled to the fullness of God. This is what He's open to you. He doesn't say, well, you know what, I'm just going to give you enough to kind of just survive for today. No, His, his forgiveness, His grace is, is lavishly expressed to us, exaggerated. It says this in verse 20, Not to Him who is able to do far more abundantly. There we go again, this lavish talk. Beyond all that you ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To Him be the glory in the church. That's you. And in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, this is, this is beautiful. I mean, it's not as though, I mean, come on. It's not as though He says, well, just, you know what, I'm going to, you sinned against me your whole life, and I'm going to make you understand that for the rest of your life. That's not God's grace. His forgiveness is, is so abundant, you can't even fathom it. You can't understand it. And he says it, verse 8, it says, in all wisdom and insight. That in context is talking about what he's given to you also. That he's given you wisdom and insight to even partially comprehend this. No one could do this but him. No one. And if that wasn't enough, the second point here is revelation. I love this because I, I literally, I'm going to tell you right now, I spent 13 hours just trying to examine what just in verse 9 and 10 meant. No, not surface level, not just trying to get this understanding that would say, okay, well, that's enough. I could skim over this, but look at what it says. He made known to us the mystery of His will. In, in time and space, the Lord revealed His plan. His revelation has unfolded. Paul calls it a mystery. Look at This is not given to some sort of interpretation towards mysticism. That's not what he's saying. This is not a Gnostic idea like God has some sort of secret knowledge that he doesn't want to share with us. No, it's, it's not mysticism. Though what, what Paul is saying has kind of a mystical meaning. But it, it really isn't that difficult. It really isn't. Just... I want you to kind of track with me. Jesus said this in Matthew 13, verse 11. This is what he says. To you has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. What is he telling his apostles? He's telling them, look, there's certain things that are being revealed right now as I minister around you. This is, hasn't been normal. God has not dwelt among you. But he now dwells among you. This is a mystery. He goes, but these things are revealed to you. These mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. You know, Psalm 25 has this same idea. Psalm 25 verse 14 it says, The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. He hasn't revealed his mysteries of the, of the gospel and his plan to those that don't belong to him. You understand that? He didn't reveal these things to the prideful and arrogant scribes and Pharisees. I remind you of Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God. And if he stopped there, we'd be like, well, we'll never know God's will. 
No. But Deuteronomy 29, 29 goes further. It says, but the things revealed to us belong to us and are to our sons forever. God has not hidden his face from humanity. Do you understand that? He hasn't hidden his face because he came down in the form of a man. That was revelation incarnate. The word in the flesh. God revealing himself to humanity. But what is further, think about this. What does he say further about this? Go to Colossians chapter 1. What is revealed more in this mystery? Colossians 1, look at verse 26. He says that, he says that is, and he's going to start revealing to us what this mystery is. It says the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of, his, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's your mystery. You want to know what it is? The God in time, God in time, decided to save a people that were not his people. That's you. That's me. Do you, do you understand the weight of this revelation? The God of the universe enters our world, reveals his will, and then after he does it, he says, this isn't secret anymore. You know, there's a part in the gospel where Jesus is discipling his own disciples. He's walking them through truth. And he's, he's telling them towards the end of his ministry, he goes, you know what, in early times I spoke to you in this fashion as if I was hiding things from you. He goes, but now I will speak plainly. You know, the thing is, they still don't get it because he told them, because I'm going to speak plainly, and he tells them that I'm going to be arrested, and I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day, I'll rise again. That went over their head. They didn't listen to that. But the point being is, like, he revealed these things to them. It, it, he wasn't hiding from them. And look at Romans chapter 3. Romans 3. Let's look at verse 24. This is what he says. Let's listen, listen to the wording. Look, let's look at verse, yeah, look at verse 24. Being justified as a gift of, uh, by grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Listen, in time, I'm going to add that so you understand. In time, whom God displayed publicly. That was, listen, listen. Christ and the cross was not man's plan. It wasn't devised by man. It was God's plan from eternity past. He says it, that God displayed him publicly on a cross. And it says this, as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. What's he, what's he saying here? He's, in time and space, God would reveal his plan. He did. You don't need more information. Do you understand that? If you sit here before me and have not committed your life to Christ, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, if you haven't trusted in him, you don't need more information. You have all the information you need. So don't make excuses if you say, well, I don't know. I don't even know if Jesus existed. Are you serious? Christ demonstrated, put in public shame on a cross. That was God's revelation. And why did he do it? Turn back to Ephesians 1 verse 9. According to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. Look at 
Do you notice the repetition? In verse 5, it says the same thing. According to his kind intention, according to his good pleasure, he purposed in him. In who? In Christ. This is, this is the revelation. What, is, what does Hebrews have to say about it? Look at Hebrews, and I know you know this, in Hebrews 1, verse 1. The Hebrews comes out the gate hot. Whoever wrote Hebrews, and I have my speculations, he was not holding back from verse 1, word 1. He says, I'm going to tell you exactly why I wrote this. He tells you about this revelation. This is what he says. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and to the prophets in many portions and in many ways, you understand that you have the Pentateuch. You have the prophets. You've read them, he's telling them. You've seen this. You've read the Psalms. But now, he says, verse 2, and these last days has spoken to us in his Son whom he appointed, there we go, here's the words again, you listen to the words, appointed, chosen, predestined. He appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Wait a second. How much more revelation do we need? Does does this truth not make you kind of take a step back and you go, you know what? I'm a part of that plan. We've been given this wisdom and insight, right? It says. But we must be good stewards to give it away. Give away this message. And and how are we to give it away? The same way God gave it away, lavishly. without any concern for ourselves, you give it away because it doesn't belong to you. Turn back to Ephesians 1. My last point is the, the rule. What do I mean by this? The next few verses are going to talk about the rule of Christ. And it's going to talk about it in different aspects, but I want you to kind of think through this. Because verse 9, look at verse 9. The last portion is, He purposed in Him. I I really believe that that portion, that last portion, He purposed in Him should be connected to verse 10. I'm going to read it that way. He purposed in Him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. What does this mean? The purpose in him with a view to an administration. You know, it uses this wording. But listen, what what does it mean in short? What does it mean in at least this first part? What is he talking about? Well, this is what it means. What God has begun. What God has begun. He will finish it. Do you understand that? You know, redemption didn't start in the Gospels. Redemption started in in Genesis 3 for us. But redemption truly started in eternity past for God. So what He started, He will finish. In Him, with a view to administration suitable to the fullness of times. This verse has a, a fulfillment in it. A fulfillment in the present and in the fulfillment in the future. You know, in the present, it sounds like this. Mark 1.15 The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's the here and now. Yet this verse also has an eschatological view. It has this in mind, the view of the eschaton, 
the, the view of the end times, the view of all the, the end of all things. Why? Because look at verse 10 again. It says it, the summing up of all things in Christ. The summing up of all things in Christ. Or to bring together everything, to bring together everything in Christ. You see, before the Lord made the, the heavens and the earth, God ordained a long-term plan. A long-term plan for His people, a long-term plan for all of humanity, that, that would eventually will culminate in the millennial kingdom. Well, why, do, why do I say this? You're thinking, well, how did you get that from there? Well, do we see now that all things are summed up in Christ? No. Is He done working? Is He done saving people? No. Look, turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2, he speaks of this, this kingdom that has no end. Look at verse 44. In the days of those kings, of the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Is there any kingdom like that now? No. And that kingdom will not be left for another, another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will, it will itself endure forever, for eternity. And as much as you saw, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that is crushed in iron and bronze and clay. Talking about the vision that he had earlier. God has made known to the king that that which will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. There's a kingdom that will be a forever kingdom. And the only eternal kingdom is Christ's kingdom. He speaks about this further. He talks about it in chapter 7, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, Revelation 20, Ezekiel 37, Zechariah 8, Isaiah 65, and on and on and on. What does this mean for us? Why does it benefit us as believers? Look, turn back to Ephesians. We have our answer in the second half of the verse. This is this the all things he's talking about. What are, what are these all things in Christ? He says it, things in heaven and things on earth. Things in heaven and things on earth. What does this mean? Jesus will ultimately and completely rule everywhere one day. Everywhere. We see this, right? In Philippians, turn to the right a bit, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, for this reason also, chapter 2, verse 9, for this reason also, God highly exalted him, that's Christ, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And you see this later on in Revelation, don't you? Verse 10, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Everyone will bow. Everyone. How do we know this is... Look at Philippians 2.10 is quoting from Isaiah 65. Again, about Messiah, a, a future kingdom. I'm sorry, Isaiah 45. But turn to, turn to Colossians chapter 1. Can I continue to highlight this? Look at Colossians 1, verse 19. Here's that same language again, right? It says, 
For it was the Father's good pleasure. That's kind intentions again, right? For all the fullness to dwell in Him. And who? In Christ. And through Him to reconcile all things to Himself. Every single thing. Do you understand that? This is what He's saying. Having made peace through the blood of Christ, of, the, of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. One day He will reconcile all of it. All of it. This is the greatest news for believers. Because eventually it says that we will reign with Him in the millennial kingdom. He will make things all new. Look at again in chapter 1 in Ephesians chapter verse 10. I'm looking at verse 11, but take a look at verse 11. And again, verse 10, and that last part says, In Him, I believe, should be attached to verse 11. So we'll read it that way. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance. Paul reminds us once more that all that is Christ is yours. All of it. In Him. We have obtained, you know, there's, um, if you have an LSB right now out there and, and you're reading this, um, this has some, kind of as a side note here, this has some interpretive challenges. The LSB translates this portion of Scripture as, we also have been made an inheritance. Gives it a different meaning, right? But it could be translated both ways. This challenge of interpreting is because that portion, those few words, are actually one compound word in the Greek. So it could be rendered both ways, and, and we have to kind of step back and say, well, well, what does it mean then? There's only two possible meanings. Let me, let me walk you through both of them. Number one, it could mean that we have a sure inheritance in Christ. Read like it says in the LSB, in Him also we have obtained an inheritance. Or it could mean that we are, the church, we are an inheritance to Christ. What's the right interpretation? Well, let me give you a shortcut. Both. Both are right. Because both are true. Remember this. Look at, look at chapter 1, verse 3. Paul, Paul speak to, uh, speaks to us with these spiritual blessings in a past tense form, right? He says, in the second half, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He's speaking as if this has already happened, and it, and it has. This is a reality for every believer. We're being blessed. We're, we are blessed in the heavenly places in Christ. Look at chapter 2, verse 6. In Ephesians here it says this, And He raised us up with Him. And look what it says, Past tense, And seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Raise your hand if you're sitting in the heavenly places right now. You could have raised your hand, you would be right. <laughs> Positionally, you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Turn to Romans, Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 17. Same, same word in here. And of children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may be glorified with Him. He talks about that this, this, is, this is a reality now. It's now. I love this. Look at First Peter chapter 1. Look at this. First Peter 1, verse 4. Again, it says almost the, same, almost the same language. And Peter, different writer, right? 
same truth says this, verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven for you. We, we, we do have an inheritance. Much of it is future, but it is, it is true now. But what about what about the second version? What if what about the the version that the LSB translated as as we are an inheritance towards Christ? Well, yeah, this is true. Are we not the bride of Christ? The people for his own possession? Look at Ephesians 5 and and you see the that we quote this passage right to counsel Married couples, but remove yourself from that thinking for a moment, and let's let's read it as, as Christ, right, as the center. Look at verse twenty-five. Husbands, love your wives, and here's the highlight: just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her, that's the bride, so that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the of water with the word, that He might present. To himself, the church, in all her glory. That's the church. We see this in, you know, turn there, but you write this down in Revelation 19, verses 7 through 9. It talks about this the Lamb of God, Christ himself, being betrothed to his bride, the church. And in the Gospel of John, if you could turn there, John. Chapter 6. Calls, it draws our attention even further of this, that the Father gives believers to the Son, right? John 6, 37. says, All the Father gives me, I will come, that will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Verse 39. This is the will of Him who sent me, that... All that he gave me, has given me, I lose nothing but raise him up on the last day. And then back to our chapter on Sunday mornings, look at chapter 10, verse 29. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Why? Because the father has given the church to the son. We are Christ's inheritance and love as He redeems His bride. Both are right. And they're more sure, these truths are more sure than the sun setting and rising tomorrow. Turn back to Ephesians. In closing, draw your attention to verse 12. This is to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ. What is, what is that end? Remember the means that God uses, right? That you hope in Christ. And that that, listen, you remember last week, that that would be to the praise of His glory. I want to read to you as we kind of close the story that that John MacArthur kind of illustrated. He illustrated the story of him going to a Christian camp, and I wanted to read it to you that we kind of soak in this kind of big idea. He says this, and I quote, Some years ago at a Christian camp in the mountains, I met a young man with a severely withered arm and leg. He always stayed at the back of the group or in the corner by himself, never participating with any other campers. On the second day, I went over to him and introduced myself and asked his name. 
He responded with a bitter scowl. Pulling up the, the sleeve to cover his deformed arm and said, Look at what God did to me. After silently praying for God's wisdom, I said, Would you like to know something? That's not you. He says, what do, you, what do you mean this is not me? He retorted. It's just the house that you live in, he told him. That's all. It's a very temporal house. But you could have a forever body. God offers a plan for you and also a new and eternal body for your future. He says, you're kidding, he said. He says, no, I'm not kidding. And then he proceeded to share the gospel with him. That day, that young man gave his life to Christ. And his attitude and outlook immediately changed. One of the first things he did was ask me to play a game of ping pong with him. He seemed in those moments not to be embarrassed or bitter about his physical handicap. You see, as soon as Jesus Christ took control of his life, he realized God had some things for him that far surpass what, from his perspective, has seemed to be the terrible, terribly important value to him. When he knew he was part of God's eternal plan and had received eternal promises, his perspective dramatically changed. Unquote. You see, the realities of the gospel ought to make your heart soar with joy and peace and hope. The Lord Jesus has accomplished in time what you could not do for yourself. And then he continues to sanctify his church and to love her and to cherish her and to grow her. Then he turns to his church and says, will you be a part of that plan? I think we could say yes, right? Pray with me. Father, we come before you once more to truly worship you, praise you for your goodness and grace. For all that you've done and all that you continue to do in each of our lives. We thank you that you have redeemed us and forgiven us. That you have lavished your grace upon us, undeserving. And not just that, Lord, that you revealed this most wonderful mystery of your gospel to us. You are kind. You are gracious. Lord, I help us, Lord, to move forward. That we would understand that our perspectives should look different. That our lives should look different. That our hope in Christ should point us to one major doxology. That all of our life would be to the praise of your glory. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.